After some nine months stranded on the Bermuda Islands, building two small ships to escape, part three of A True Reportory of the Rack follows their travels from there to Jamestown, which had been founded some three years prior by their ship's captain, Christopher Newport. The conditions in Jamestown were dire, and three times Newport had returned to England for more supplies and personnel, often returning to find great numbers of the people falling sick and dying. This third resupply trip, of course, encountered a hurricane, as described in part one, losing most of their supplies in the process. The small boats they managed to build in Bermuda uh, were barely large enough to carry the voyagers and some small store of provisions. Over 80% of the colonists had died during what was known as the starving time of the prior winter. Of course, the author of this report, William Strachey, had himself passed through two extremely desperate situations simultaneous to that starving time, so perhaps we may understand his frustrations with the chaos and anarchy that had settled over Jamestown. We may also consider that the extreme challenges that faced these colonists would make the shareholders of the Virginia Company, Strachey's eventual readers, to question the continuance of this investment, whether they should send even more ships, supplies, and personnel. Assumedly, Strachey had a crucial interest in keeping that spirit of investment alive. It may help to know that it was also those shareholders who had directed the company to work their way in from the shore where they might thereby be safe from attack from other seafaring countries looking to stake a claim in this brave new world. And as such, they pushed inward to Jamestown. A True Reportery of the Rack, Part 3 The 10th of May, we set sail with an easy gale, the wind at the south. We struck a rock on the starboard side, over which the buoy rid, God knows we might have been like enough to have returned anew and dwelt there for another ten months of great labor. But God was more merciful unto us, and the wind served us easily all that day and the next, when to our great joy we got clear of the islands, after which we held to a southerly course for seven days. The 17th of May we had much rubbish swim by our ship's side, whereby we knew we were not far from land. The 20th, about midnight, we had a marvelous, sweet smell from the shore, and by daybreak one of the sailors decried land. About an hour after, we coasted past Cape Henry, named so in honor of our young prince. This is the famous Chesapeake Bay, from which, across the bay, lieth another headland, which we called, in honor of our princely Duke of York, Cape Charles, and these lie distant each from the other some seven leagues. Indeed, it is a goodly bay, and a fairer, not easily found. The 21st, we came up to Point Comfort. This fort easily commands the mouth of the river, and there those men from the shore reported how our ships did indeed arrive safely the last year, and how our people, well increased, had therefore builded this fort. Our governor went ashore, but soon had unexpected and heavy news that our people up the river at Jamestown were suffering under much worse conditions. Though there was no wind stirring, over two days we plied it sadly upriver to cast anchor before Jamestown, and our much grieved governor, finding nothing but misery and misgovernment, caused the bell of the church to be rung, wherein our minister made a zealous and sorrowful prayer. Viewing the fort, we found the palisados torn down, the ports open, the gates from off their hinges, and empty houses where the owners had died, and which the neighboring dwellers had rent up and burnt, rather than stepping into the woods a stone's cast off to fetch other firewood. And it is also true, the Indian killed as fast without as famine and pestilence did within. Our governor found the colony in this desolation and misery with no hope to amend it, for we had brought from the Bermudas no greater store of provision that might well serve 150 for a sea voyage. It was now, likewise, but their seed time, and all their corn scarce put into the ground. 
nor was there at the fort any means to take fish, nor one eye of sturgeon to be found in the river. Even our own men grew disheartened and faint when they saw this misery. Our governor made a speech, giving the company to understand that what provision he had, they should equally share, at which there was a general acclamation and shout of joy on both sides. In the meanwhile, our governor published certain orders and instructions which were set up on a post in the church for all to see. The privy factionaries shall never find time nor darkness to wipe away nor cover their ignoble and irreligious practices. Indeed, right noble lady, let me speak freely. When riot, sloth, and vanity should arise in a country so greatly stored with abundance and plenty, the result is a continual wasting no husbandry, the old store spent with no order for new provisions, and even when something was in store, in their idleness they were unwilling to sow corn for their own bellies, or to put in a root or herb for their gardens. I say in this neglect, to lie sick and languish, should it be expected that health, plenty, and all the goodness of a well-ordered state might flow in this country? You have a right and noble heart, worthy lady. Please understand that the wants and wretchedness which they have endured ascend not out of the poverty and vileness of the country. What England may boast of, God and nature here have favorably bestowed. No country yieldeth goodlier corn, nor more manifold increase. Large fields we have, and thousands of goodly vines which yield a plentiful grape. Were these natural vines, planted, dressed, and ordered with skill, they would surely make a perfect grape and fruitful vintage in short order. We have made trial of our own English seeds, kitchen herbs, and roots, and find them to prosper as speedily as in England. Only let me acknowledge that those men for whom no example either of goodness or punishment can deter from their habitual impieties, number less than a hundred or two. But it is those very men who must be the carpenters and workmen in this so glorious a building. Then let no rumor of the poverty of the country wave off any man's fair purposes hither. I will acknowledge, dear lady, that when men of rank and quality work alongside such men, they set on to their labors with much greater content. I have heard the inferior people profess that they should never refuse to do their best when worthy and noble gentlemen go in before to help them with their hand and defend them with their sword. Those laborers, please know, are not yet so taxed, but that by ten have done their morning's work, and until it be the three of the clock again, they take their own pleasure, and afterwards, with the setting of the sun, their day's labor is finished. If this business be continued, I doubt nothing but God's favor toward such a country, fitted for such a trade as shall give increase both to the adventurers and free burghers thereof, as great as any trade in Christendom. For two weeks, our governor attempted and made trial to improve the state and condition of the country. But in light of how little we brought from the Bermudas, we soon found ourselves ten days from starving. And even though the Indians themselves were quite poor, they were forbidden by their subtle king, Pohatan, to trade with us. Instead, he would drive them to endanger and assault any boat upon the river or straggler out of the fort, by which diverse of our men had been killed. And yet they would dare then to enter our ports to trade with us, when in truth they came but as spies to discover our strength. Much of this state of misgovernment is due to the mariners, who make a prey of our poor people, not sparing them a dust of corn nor a pint of beer, unless they be paid an East Indian increase, four for one. And yet they would send off their longboats by night and trade with the Indians for their trifles, otter skins, beavers, raccoon furs, bear skins, to the point that when the trade master for the colony in the daytime offered trade, 
The Indians would laugh and scorn them in light of what bargains they were given by night, by which means the market forestalled. I may boldly say these dishonest men have been the cause of the death and the starving of many. In response, the Lord Governor appointed a commissary general who, receiving the store for the colony, might keep a just account of what is transported and taken a denture from the master of each ship, what he hath in charge, of which, if any be wanting, the said master shall make it good out of his own entertainment. Otherwise, the pursers, stewards, and quartermasters would think it all well gotten that they can purloin and steal away. With no fish to be seen, our governor sent his longboat to coast the river, downward as far as Point Comfort, and from thence to Cape Henry and Cape Charles, and all within the bay, which returned without any fruits of their labors, scarce getting so much fish as served their own company. Our governor was moved to draw forth such provisions as he had brought, proportioning a measure equally to everyone alike, upon consulting with Sir George Summers and Captain Newport, ultimately to save all from starving, they would abandon the country, and in the present pinnaces, along with the two small ships built at the Bermudas, with all speed convenient, make for the new found land, where, being the fishing time, they might meet with many English ships into which they might disperse most of the company. The governor commanded every man aboard, and to preserve the town unburned, which some intemperate and malicious people threatened, he kept his own company last ashore, and was himself the last to embark. The next morning's tide brought us to another island where we discovered a longboat making towards us from Point Comfort. To our joy, this boat brought intelligence that the Honorable Lord de la Ware had arrived at Algernon Fort two days before. Upon learning of our resolution to depart the country, he dispatched his letters to our governor, who upon the receipt relanded us all at the fort again. The 10th of June, being Sunday, his lordship, La Ware, likewise landed his ships and came ashore with his followers. Here, worthy lady, I must briefly describe the situation of our fort. Captain Newport, in his first voyage three years before, avoided building a settlement upon so open a road as Cape Henry and Point Comfort, and instead looked for the most apt and securest place which might give the least cause of offense or distaste, in his judgment, to the native inhabitants. After much weary search, some threescore miles and better up the channel from Cape Henry, they had sight of an extended plain and spot of earth which thrust out into the depth and midst of the channel, with uh, no inhabitants by some seven miles. A certain quantity of that little half-island of ground was measured, which they began to fortify with the ablest and speediest means they could, which fort, growing since to more perfection, is now called, in honor of his majesty, Jamestown. And thus, armed for the injury of changing times and seasons of the year, we hold ourselves well paid, remembering the old epigraph. We dwell not here, to build us bowers and halls for pleasure and good cheer, but halls we build for us and ours, to dwell in them whilst we live here. True, our fort, or Jamestown, is yet seated amid an unwholesome air and a marshy, low ground, and hath no fresh water springs but what we drew from a well, a well fed by the brackish river oozing into it, from whence I believe many diseases and sicknesses have happened to our people. Had we set up on some hill with fresh springs and clear air, we might have, I believe, well escaped. But of four hundred, some men of our fleet who arrived before us, seated at the falls, and of one hundred to the seawards on the south side of our river, there did not so much as one man miscarry. Whereas at Jamestown, through those same months, one hundred sickened a half of which died. And yet let us not lay scandal and imputation upon the country of Virginia, because that little quarter wherein we unadvisedly set down was unwholesome and subject to ill airs, which accompany such like marshy places. And that's part three. 
it seems that these voyagers and colonists just cannot catch a break, either with the weather or their own internal divisiveness. Stay tuned for part four, which finds the colonists ever more at odds with the native population. Again, this tale provided the most recognizable inspiration for Shakespeare's The Tempest, a play which finds a similar chaos and mismanagement of man caught up amid the temptations and the punishments of nature. Let me know in the comments just what parts of this remind you of Shakespeare's play. Thank you.